Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson. Honored to welcome Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, David Malpass, to Hudson Institute. The Undersecretary is a longtime friend of Hudson Institute, well known. Uh, before his return to Washington, through his column in Forbes and his regular appearances on the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal, he serves as the principal advisor to Secretary Mnuchin on a very vigorous uh, international economic agenda and overseas policies in the areas of finance, trade and financial services, investment economic development, and international debt policy, and coordinates financial market policy with the group of seven industrialized countries. Under Secretary Malpass, of course, previously served uh, in key positions at Treasury under President Ronald Reagan and at State under President uh, George H.W. Bush, and uh, served also uh, handled tax and trade issues at the Senate uh, Budget Committee. The Under Secretary will offer opening remarks, and then he will be joined in conversation with Hudson Institute Senior Fellow Tom Dusterberg. Tom served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for International Economic Policy under George H. George uh, H.W. Bush, and he served also as Chief of Staff to Dan Quayle in the Senate and Chris Cox in the House, and also was the President of the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome David Malpass. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thanks for the invitation to discuss the global outlook. I would like to thank uh, uh, Hudson and the, and the team, uh, the Ken Weinstein, uh, uh, Tom Dusterberg, Dan McGivern, and the whole Hudson team for setting this up. Um, I'd like to use the time today to discuss the strong US and global growth outlook and some of the vulnerabilities and initiatives in Treasury's international section, which I head. Despite the stock market volatility, the economy is enjoying a period of relative strength and prosperity in both the US and in many other countries. President Trump's regulatory and energy initiatives took hold in 2017, and tax reform became a realistic possibility, adding materially to US growth. Growth topped 3% in the second and third quarters and 2.6% in the fourth quarter, bringing four-quarter growth to its fastest pace since 2014. Many forecasting models lowball the longer-term growth effect of the new tax law by focusing on its fiscal mechanisms rather than the structural change. The real-world effect of tax cuts comes from businesses, large and small, responding to improvements in growth policies, including lasting regulatory tax and energy reforms. By lowering the corporate tax rate to 21% from 35%, the new law in, it aligns incentives so that managers focus more on creating profitable <clears throat> businesses and building their labor pool rather than offshoring jobs and devising expensive financial structures to minimize taxes. Importantly, the new law will benefit many unincorporated businesses. They are often the nimblest and best able to hire and train workers new to their industry, precisely the workers the president wants to draw back into the labor force. The new law provides small pass-through businesses with a 20% tax deduction, helping them compete with big companies and government-dominated industries. As their workers gain skills, their productivity increases rapidly, allowing more growth than assumed in the models. I hear two general criticisms of the president's economic program, but from opposite directions. Some say that President Trump inherited a solid economy and that the credit for growth should go to President Obama. Others say President Trump inherited an economy that has an inherently low growth potential so his growth program risks overheating, leaving the current upturn short-lived. Neither criticism stands up. Prior to president, the president's election, the consensus outlook was for weak growth through 2017 and 2018, with longer forecasts equally bleak. Slow growth had become endemic, with GDP growth averaging only 1.9% per year due, in my mind, to a policy mix that discouraged growth. 
it seems clear from the data that there was a positive change in growth prospects after the election, not before. Regarding the argument that the Trump administration's policies won't help for very long because we're in secular stagnation, we won't know for sure for several years. However, initial signs are that the new economic program is working with policies explicitly supportive of growth and key forward-looking indicators signaling a continued acceleration. The tax law encourages U.S. business investment, allows a better allocation of capital, and encourages small business dynamism. This combination of structural improvements will draw more workers into the labor force, improving their skills. This will allow the economy to rebuild from the low average growth rate that preceded the Trump administration. Measures of business investment, business confidence, hiring intentions, and profit expectations are all up sharply, and I expect new business formation to begin to rise from the deep trough of recent years. The administration is continuing with regulatory and energy reforms and undertaking a major imp improvement in infrastructure policy, all of which encourage people to start new businesses and hire workers that have been left out. Many aspects of the growth outlook can't be reduced to models. A key pr growth provision in the tax bill uh, limits the federal deduction for state and local taxes to $10,000 a year. Without that limit, previous law provided a massive federal subsidy to wealthy households in high tax states. Reducing this transfer of resources from small government states to big government states will allow capital and investment to flow more freely to profitable job creating investments around the country. The poorer counties in high tax states have huge growth potential if their state and local governments were to restrain their spending and taxes in response to the tax law change. Similarly, low tax states can grow even faster as the tax <coughs> headwind from subsidized high tax states diminishes. Looking globally, a key question is whether the economic acceleration in the U.S. and the success with the new tax law will lead to a series of growth-oriented reforms abroad. The stability in the financial system is making abundant amounts of private capital available, lifting many parts of the world, and sparking innovations in financial technology, telecommunications, microloans, and payment systems. At Treasury, we're working to use this period of relative stability to encourage structural reforms elsewhere. The G20 group, I'll, and I, I want to go through several of the Treasury initiatives and then talk about vulnerabilities and then move to uh, uh, Tom Dusterberg and questions. Uh, uh, the, the, some of the initiatives at Treasury uh, on the international front. The G20 group of major economies provides a central forum to encourage various growth initiatives around the world. We've asked the G20 to focus its activities on a few core objectives, including infrastructure, uh, debt transparency and sustainability, and countering illicit finance. We're working to encourage more focus at the Financial Stability Board, which works to coordinate world financial regulators. Within the G7, we place great value on our dialogue on key strategic challenges, including cybersecurity, illicit finance, and development finance. With the 2018 lead leadership summits in Peru, Canada, and Argentina, the Americas has a unique opportunity for regional progress. We've put forward an 11-part set of initiatives that we've named America Cresce, or Americas Grow, so to encourage growth and freedom, building on the region's ideals of democracy, transparency, human rights, and the rule of law. Treasury and the administration are working in, on ways to increase trade and investment in energy and infrastructure. Um, and the anchor for these growth initiatives in the Western Hemisphere uh, is the region's need for energy and infrastructure investment. We continue to hear from U.S. firms that corruption and the wide range of standards is a major impediment to increased U.S. investment ab abroad, raising the bar on public integrity, uh, uh, on public integrity, and increasing trans 
transparency and uh, uh, stronger standards will make economies more productive and efficient. Also, Treasury is committed to better utilizing existing institutions to create the potential for faster growth, both in Latin America and around the world. Um, four, I want to take note, four major Latin countries have grouped in a Pacific alliance to create a regional investment passport that would permit investment fund, in, investments uh, in any of the four countries to market and distribute securities throughout the alliance. Therefore, the ongoing evolution of the global financial system has impacted uh, businesses and countries around the world, and, and, uh, uh, and those are areas that we're working to improve the technology, improve the, uh, um, the work streams in order to uh, 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 create a more peaceful and stable environment that allows faster growth and higher median incomes. Um, and I, I don't want to downplay one of the most important achievements of 2018 uh, in the Western Hemisphere would be to see political and economic freedom for all citizens. In Venezuela, the United States joins with the members of the Lima Group uh, and with the European Union in demanding free and fair elections to reduce Venezuela's slide into dictatorship and poverty. And in Cuba, we condemn the leadership transition that is taking place without the voice of the people there. Our democratic allies in the region should know and anticipate the benefits derived from embracing and promoting democratic practices. Likewise, the autocrats and dictators should know and anticipate the consequences of undemocratic practices and illegal acts. Now I'd like to spend a few remaining minutes on three other risks and vulnerabilities. One is leverage. While low bond yields have provided major stimulus for large borrowers and those involved in bond issuance, the low yields and availability of long-term debt creates a new set of potential risks. Debt and leverage have increased across a wide range of the global economy. For corporations, multilateral institutions, fiscal authorities, and expanded central bank balance sheets. For example, with finance, financing costs lower than in the past, the temptation for governments is to spend more, arguing that the debt is easily financed. This underscores the importance of structural reforms to avoid excesses, invest wisely, and make sure that growth accelerates to service the expanding debt burdens. Brexit is another vulnerability. We are monitoring the developments in, Brex in the Brexit process in which the UK will leave the European Union. The, processes, the process creates major challenges and opportunities in terms of international organizations and US businesses and jobs. Also, China is a vulnerability. China has grown to be an economic force in the world economy. And for many years, the United States welcomed its steps toward liberaliz liberalization. Chinese growth contributed to global economic growth. And the hope was that China would develop into a fair, reciprocal, and market-oriented partner for trade and investment. However, the direction in China has clearly shifted. Market liberalization has stalled and even reversed, with the role of the state increasing. State-owned enterprises have not faced hard budget constraints, and China's industrial policy has become more and more problematic for foreign firms. Huge export credits are flowing in non-economic ways that distort markets and leave borrowers burdened with ineffective pro projects and heavy debt burdens. China takes advantage of the open investment climate provided by the US and other countries, but does not offer or allow a reciprocal investing relationship. While it professes to embrace globalization and openness, in practice, its trade regime is mercantilistic and restrictive, and China has not embraced fair and market-oriented policies. The WTO has shown the, an inability to resolve disputes limit subsidies, or draw China into the market status that was envisioned when China joined the WTO. When China, uh, it, it, when China entered, it was not intended that China would continue requiring intellectual property to move to China and then be absorbed by China, or that heavy export subsidies would be maintained. Thus, 
As China's portion of world GDP increases, China's direction away from markets is a key risk in the long-term global growth outlook, and we're working with market-oriented economies around the world to find constructive responses. In conclusion, the U.S. government places a high priority on growth at home and abroad. We think investment, trade, markets, and democracy are critical. I've outlined a U.S. and global environment that we think is improving in terms of its growth potential. While there are risks, we're working hard to foster that potential. I welcome a dialogue with you, and thank you. I'll look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much. We shall give David a few minutes to uh, catch his breath. Uh -huh, sorry about let, that. let me just um, uh, say we, we have a limited amount of time, and uh, we hope to get to questions from the audience. Um, but in order to make things more efficient, we've asked people who have questions to put them on a card, I think, um, and then we will... Uh, I will look through the through the various questions and try to find the most relevant ones to uh, ask the undersecretary. So, if you have questions um, as it comes up, just raise your hand, and somebody, one of our staff, will give you a card to write down your question. So let's <clears throat> let's drill down on a few of the points that uh, the undersecretary made uh, in his opening remarks. First of all, in tax bill and growth, um, uh, one of the key elements. Uh, uh, of the bill was to uh, move to a territorial system. And one of the President Reagan's, uh, President Reagan, I'm sorry, President Trump's leading um, campaign promises was to bring jobs back to the United States. Can you, do you think the tax bill uh, is going to cause a uh, major move back to production in the United States from abroad, either in terms of American companies coming back home, or foreign companies being more incented to produce in the United States? I think so, yes, to both. I worked for President Reagan on the, on the 86 tax bill, and that, that was a major success. By lowering the rates, you got more businesses investing uh, in the US, and that, in turn, also contributes to global growth. One of the things I think that's core for people to recognize is it's not a zero-sum uh, kind of world economy. So yes, I think we can create more jobs in the U.S. and we will end up uh, seeing more jobs abroad, especially as I noted in my remarks, if other countries also do structural reforms. As, as countries make their economies go better, more jobs are created. So sp specifically in, in this bill, uh, a critical point is lowering the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. Economic models and sometimes the public dialogue doesn't fully appreciate how constructive that is. So we've been uh, having U.S. companies talk about competitiveness, labor under this idea that you could you could have a higher tax rate and still compete in a global economy where everyone, where many of the other countries had lowered their rates. It just wasn't working, and so now with the rate lower we're going to see people be able to make a choice on where they invest, and a lot of that will be in the U.S. Okay, another um, uh, goal of the tax re reform bill was to um, make the costs of uh, capital investment uh, less burdensome to business. There's been a lot of talk of uh, secular stagnation in, in the United States. Do you think the tax bill will... Uh, uh, reverse the uh, the trend towards lower capital investment in this country, and that will that be a major stimulus to growth in and of itself? Uh, yes, and uh, it already has. If you look at the fourth quarter data, very strong growth in uh, core capital goods, uh, and so uh, there there really is a, a launch. Part of that is investment uh, expensing was. Uh, what began to take effect uh, in in uh, in at, toward the end of 2017, and I think we'll have more effect in 2018. That's the ability to fully expense uh, uh, new investments. So that will be a direct uh, uh, incentive and possibility of using cash flow to make 
to hire a new, to buy a new machine. But, at, at, and, and I think it's, a, it's critical for people to recognize as new equipment is uh, installed into the U.S. economy, that means that skills will be enhanced. Someone has to learn how to operate the machine. Someone has to make the machine. Uh, someone has to train the trainers. And there's a whole, I think, ripple or, or, or waterfall of benefits that comes out of that new investment. So a lot of times the computer models just look at how many machines are going to be bought. Uh, but the, the true benefit uh, is going to be in uh, people that didn't have the skills to do that job before that are needed by the, by, as the company purchases, they have to hire workers to go with it. And those are often going to be new workers, ones that haven't just left another job, but they're actually being added to the uh, participation rate to the labor force. So uh, I, I, my, uh, my view is that we will get long lasting benefits from those changes in the tax code. I did a Wall Street Journal article a couple of weeks ago going through that uh, the modeling is often trying to say that this is just a one-time benefit that's going on within the US economy. But I think to the extent that it changes what companies do, and I mentioned in my remarks, new business formation had really fallen into a low trough for years. Something had happened in the US economy that caused small businesses not to be formed. And that led to the idea of secular stagnation. I think that was to a large extent because of the policies. So as you begin to change regulatory energy tax policies, businesses start forming. They buy a machine, put workers to work, teach the skills, and that becomes a, a, a positive uh, uh, process. David, you've been a champion of small business throughout your uh, yeah. government and business career uh, and have emphasized the impact of the tax bill and deregulation on the small business sector. If, if the uh, National Federation of Independent Business Optimism Index is uh, a uh, quantitative index of uh, what Keynes called the animal spirits, it seems to be working. But what specifically would you say in the tax bill uh, and the new Trump administration policy is helping small business? Yeah, well, part of it is this intangible aspect of, uh, of attitude. So the government uh, now, the, the Trump administration has a strong attitude that we like small businesses to form. That hasn't been as clear in the past in the policies. So that means regulatory policy. I, I hate to go, do, go through it over and over again, but I think it's critical for, for people that are thinking about starting a business to realize that, uh, that that's actually invited, embraced, encouraged by government policy. That's uh, general regulatory policy, financial services regulatory policy, tax policy, energy policy. And so I think we're going to see some um, business formation, small business formation, uh, begin to start up finally, which is, I think, one of the best indicators of future growth. OK, let's move to another major area of your uh, responsibilities, which is uh, trade policy. Uh, and you mentioned um, several times in your remarks about China going in an illiberal direction. You also noted that um, the World Trade Organization is not always um, has doesn't always have the tools to address Chinese subsidies um, and other um, uh, practices which are undermining Western economies. Um, should we be working to change the World Trade Organization rules to take into account this, this new type of actor whose uh, uh, size is, is unprecedented in the, in the world history of the world economy? Um, I think so. I think there need to be changes to make it uh, uh, work and be effective. And that's, you, you know, you don't have to do you don't have to go through this from a look back standpoint of, of uh, uh, I, I think what we can c agree as almost worldwide that uh, 
as China in the 90s was moving toward its entry into the WTO, it was actually liberalizing. Uh, and that, that means price liberalization was occurring. The, the reliance on state-owned enterprises was going down. China had a message to the world that it uh, wanted to be a full participant in the global financial system and in the world economy. It joined organizations and actually participated in those uh, uh, organizations and then entered the WTO on that basis. And as I suggested in my remarks, then they, they slowed down that liberalization trend and I think even have reversed it. So for the world then, we should uh, um, think about how to make WTO effective in a world that where, where uh, where China didn't go in the direction that was anticipated in its entry into the WTO. Um, and that may mean changes in WTO, but we also hope at, uh, that it would mean changes by China in the direction that it's going. It's espoused an, industri an aggressive industrial policy where it plans to take over world industries. Now, you, we, some years ago, the U.S. might have ignored that or said, you know, I doubt it. Uh, but now uh, uh, there, there has to be, that has to be taken as a serious challenge to where the world is going. Because that would mean uh, imposing China's system of non-market activity onto those global sectors. And that's not a good way for the workers, for the people of the world to, to go. So I do hope... WTO can can be effective, though I'm afraid that at its core, there are certain parts of, uh, of the global system. For example, subsidies. China provides a huge level of subsidies to its state-owned enterprises. Those aren't adequately addressed in the WTO. Are you, as um, the lead Sherpa on G20 and uh, G7 meetings, on economic issues, um, are you happy with the amount of uh, co cooperation from some of our traditional uh, free market allies in Europe, Japan, Pacific Rim, with regard to working on these right, uh, emerging issues with China? Um, we have great communication so the the U US is uh, is very much engaged in the world that's something that we want to do and that we work hard at so I spend a lot of time I was uh, last week in Canada for the G7 meeting of, of uh, uh, deputies that that work uh, on uh, on financial uh, and well uh, uh, on on a range of issues of interest to the to the major uh, G7 economies, um, so the, the the communication is excellent. The coordination is is good. Uh, Canada is hosting the G7 this year, and Argentina is hosting the uh, the G20 bigger group of countries. And there's uh, a lot of uh, common common understanding of what we want to do in those. One is to 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 since the world's not in a uh, in a financial crisis, we don't have to have as many working groups working on financial crisis as in in some recent years, and that means uh, allowing uh, working groups uh, to actually issue their final report and then stop meeting. That actually turns out to be a huge challenge for international groupings because the the tradition and the practice and the whole setup is that the, the or that uh, committees continue uh, existing uh, for decades after their purpose has been fulfilled uh, and so we're trying to do that and also have a focus on things that can be accomplished where where international coordination actually works I mentioned infrastructure where there the, it, the world would benefit from uh, from common financial instruments that allow investment in infrastructure so that it can uh, provide capital to the projects that are needed. There's not right now 
that commonality. So we're working on that. Cybersecurity, obviously, being one that's of common interest to lots of countries in terms of how, how can they keep their own systems safe? How do they respond to the uh, challenge of terrorism or illicit uh, uh, funding? So those are all, I think, going very well in terms of uh, global communication. And I emphasize that in a, in a city here in Washington, we're on Pennsylvania Avenue, where, where uh, there's been a polarization, which is unfortunate. And sometimes communication isn't as good and clear as it could be. But my perception is on an international, uh, uh, in the international sphere, it's it's going well in that regard. That doesn't mean we don't have disagreements. And one of the disagreements I'll mention is simply there's a tendency in, in I'll, I'll single out Europe, but it's really a challenge for everyone, to expand, uh, expand uh, r regulators uh, into all sorts of spheres. And so that's something that really is a challenge for the world to grapple with, that governments, wherever they are, are seeking to grow and they want to grow rapidly and so how do you how do you uh, uh, reconcile that with the with w workers with with uh, with people that aren't in government in those countries which in most countries is more than half the people are not in government and don't actually want to see the governments growing with with no limits and so how do we how do we work with other countries on that idea as well uh, one more quick question on, on trade. You've um, said in some of your uh, public remarks about the Trans-Pacific Partnership that it's unworkable. I think you used that term. Uh, the president seems to have opened the door at least to uh, consider at some point going back to the TPP. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on what you think is unworkable on the agreement and how we might think about fixing it? Yeah, and, and so I don't know that the president said go back to the TPP. He, he, what, what he said was that there are circumstances where TPP could work for American workers. And, uh, that, and so the, the, as I think about it, what was unworkable was the, the way the, the – so TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, involves 11 – uh, countries plus the United States, though the United States is not is not uh, uh, seeking to to enter. So there are 11 countries who continue to talk about forming a a trade group, a free trade group, and we recognize uh, uh, certain parts of that that negotiation and of the language that they developed as beneficial. In fact, we've incorporated some of the chapters from TPP into the upgrade, the update of NAFTA that is underway and being, being negotiated. And so there's value in certain parts of the TPP discussion. But the problems were that from the standpoint of US workers, too much was given, given up within the details of the agreement. And further, there's an unworkability of trying to get 11 countries together to settle disputes in a way that actually uh, uh, maintains the values of U.S. law in terms of property rights, the, the, the court and judicial system. And so there were too many problems with the way TPP was set up. Um, so as we look going forward, I think the president's bigger point is we are open to discussions on trade with lots of countries around the world. He's been very explicit in wanting free, free trade agreements with like-minded countries that can actually, where they want to grow and they want to see us grow, and we maximize a kind of a positive sum relationship. So uh, the, his his uh, 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 discussion or raising TPP was in the context that the U.S. wants constructive outcomes uh, that expand global markets. And where we can find that, we are open to discussion. Okay. In, in, your, in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, Brexit as a vulnerability. Uh, the United States and the U.K. are the leading financial services uh, powers in, in the world. I wonder if there are any possibilities for 
um, constructive outcomes once uh, the, the Brexit is completed in terms of financial services? Is there a chance for some regulatory harmonization be between ourselves and uh, the British? And how would that impact our ability to work uh, for financial services companies to be in the uh, continental Europe market? Um, so uh, the, the UK is right now in a negotiation and discussion with the European Union on how to exit uh, the European Union. So that, the, and the US is not part of that discussion because it's their, their union that is, uh, that is being separated. And so we have to watch th that play out and look. So one of the things we want to do for the US is try to achieve a level playing field for our financial services companies as well as others as the UK breaks up. Uh, now, separately then, uh, or I mean, that raises a whole range of challenges. One is the transition rules that occur at the end or when, when the UK leaves, uh, leaves the European Union in, in 2019. And so what will the transition be and how long will it last and will it be um, growth enhancing? Um, so so I, I wanted to give that preface because we really have to go through that. As they work out their new relationship, I think there'll be big opportunities for the US to have good trade and services relations and financial including financial services with the UK and with the with the EU and so we want to just be in a position to engage when they're ready uh, and and create uh, create a good environment for the US to do business in you know the US has a huge number of jobs uh, that are in that are that are engaged uh, in Europe, and we'd like more. And engaged with the UK, we'd like more. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think there's constructive outcomes, uh, but right now they have to work on their on their relationship. That's that's the critical thing to make go go well. Um, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll give you, you know, there's a lot of substance in how we interact with them. One of the things um, that's a little different in the U.S. system from Europe is the idea of uh, 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 regulation that fits the size of the company. The U.S. has a pretty good uh, tradition of recognizing that bigger companies need a different type of regulation than smaller companies companies. And that applies in financial services as well. You wouldn't want to regulate uh, a community bank in exactly the same way you you regulate a, a big money center bank. Whereas in Europe, there's not as much of that established uh, concept. So we're working with Europe to encourage uh, them to move away from one size fits all and to actually uh, have regulations that work for different size businesses. This goes to the theme we talked about earlier of small businesses, I think, are critical to job creation. Europe has this challenge. They ha still have high unemployment rate. Uh, and so, uh, so that means they need, the way I think about that, a lot of small businesses to be created in Italy, in Germany, in France, in, in, and that would be good for them. I think that would be good for us because we all benefit from mutual growth. So we're, 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 we want to take the stance in international regulatory forum for that, uh, that regulations should work for small businesses, and they haven't been. So let's get it right so that people can grow. Yeah, I'm, one more question before turning to the uh, audience. Um, you mentioned that Treasury is very involved in the uh, Western Hemisphere Initiative, and Treasury has taken a lead on that. Two questions from that. Is the growing influence of China and ways to counter that growing influence in the Western Hemisphere uh, up, something you guys are working on? And number two, um, Venezuela is clearly in economic trouble. Um, do, are you developing contingency plans so that um, in a worst case scenario, we can respond quickly to a collapse of that economy? Uh, so that was two questions. <laughs> it, it was, sorry. So with regard to uh, 
China, uh, as as uh, w what they what we want to do is create an environment for the Western Hemisphere where other countries see that we are a positive partner and that the U.S. is interested in investing in their countries, in getting investment from their countries, in having a lot of trade. Uh, and that includes in the energy sector, we can have a lot more growth in Latin America growth that benefits American workers uh, by, by expanding the, uh, the relationship in the energy sector. No, notable over in recent years is the, the uh, uh, discovery and, and uh, development of natural gas resources in the U.S., which turned out to be much, much, much bigger than people had realized and expected, and that's lowering the cost which creates whole new opportunities for Latin America to grow using natural gas as, a, uh, as an energy source. So we're working on, uh, on ways to have ag ag agreements and relationships that make that possible, which hasn't, hasn't been done enough. Uh, it, during that vacuum where the US wasn't, I think, doing enough in the Western Hemisphere in, in previous years, uh, uh, China had been stepping in and offering an alternative that simply wasn't as good as the one offered by the U.S. They, China often is using uh, uh, export credit agencies. That means Chinese lenders, government, almost totally government-owned lenders that use subsidized finance to attract deals that then require procurement or end up generating procurement from China. Uh, and so it's an unbalanced relationship that leaves the country uh, with a whole bunch of debt. Venezuela, turning to the second issue then, is a case in point. They are China's biggest investment in the region. It's a completely failed state in that they are non-democratic. And Venezuela's biggest uh, funder and source of resources for it has has been China, which uh, uh, resources don't end up going to the people of Venezuela. They end up going to the government officials, and so th this is a, a problem that that involves the Western Hemisphere. And and so we ju saw just this morning Peru stepping forward uh, and saying that that uh, Venezuela is not invited to the summit of the Americas, which will occur in Peru in April. Uh, the, and so that I think that's constructive in that you have a non non elected uh, uh, leader, and the region, uh, the neighbors of Venezuela, are stepping forward and saying uh, this this uh, uh, this is not beneficial to treat them as one of the democracies of the region. There still is the anomaly of Cuba, uh, which is going through a, an election now where the voice of the people is not heard. The, in the they they call it an an election, and so there still is this problem of uh, Cuba being non democratic and yet being treated oftentimes by con other countries in the region uh, as as uh, uh, part of the Western Hemisphere when it's violating the principles of democracy that are so important. So as far as if if Venezuela uh, be, moved in a in a democratic way with free and fair elections, which we've strongly encouraged. I'm sure that the U.S. Uh, will, be, will be part of an international uh, uh, consensus to help support the people of Venezuela as they try to uh, recover from this. But let, let me make clear, uh, they right now on the books owe a huge amount of money to China, which did not benefit the people of Venezuela. So you have to get over that uh, and, 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 and try to say to China, this is not helpful to the, to the people in the Western Hemisphere to uh, go about business practices this way. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the time that we have. Um, the questions I have from the audience are, um, um, relate to China. Again, we've sort of covered that, but let me just try to combine these two. Um, have we had any success in talking with the Chinese about currency manipulation? And can we expect more anti-dumping and countervailing duty type measures uh, against China? 
So on the latter point, I do expect more. You know, the anti-dumping countervailing duty is a is a common is a, a not unusual part of U.S. trade law, and uh, uh, a response to uh, dumping and excess capacity f worldwide. But uh, and and China is uh, has has uh, uh, is a subject of quite a few of those actions. So I I think there will be more um, as. I'm sorry, what was our other part? <laughs> um, have we had any success yeah. in talking with the Chinese uh, so about currency manipulation? We, I, uh, talk, we talk with uh, the Chinese regularly. As far as, uh, I, I don't want to be very uh, uh, specific on, uh, on currency topics. We, Treasury, put out a twice a year report on currency manipulation. So that will be coming out in, uh, in a, a month or two. Two, and that addresses currency manipulation uh, around the world. Um, so I'll leave it to that report. But I will note on currencies in general uh, that that uh, uh, over the la uh, it, within the IMFC uh, communique, which came out in October, there were there was a recognition that the, that the currencies have been more stable. Than in the past, and that and that was welcomed and uh, associated with good fundamental policies. As fundamental policies are better, you end up with a good, a better result uh, for currencies, and that all goes together with more growth and investment. So, what, one of the dominant things going on in the world right now is the acceleration of growth that's going on in most countries around the world. That's a very welcome. Uh, development that's occurred over the last year. Okay, on that optimistic note, um, I'll thank you for your generous generosity of your spending time with us and being covering so many different subjects so comprehensively. Thank you, so Tom. Join me, everybody. everybody.